Hey, Riverdale, we're about to launch into our study on the book of Job. However, before we get too far, I just have a few instructions I want to give you. When the teaching time is over, we've included some follow-up questions for you to answer. If you're watching this with your family, you can answer these all together. If it's just you, um, you can answer these on your own. But please take the time to really think about these questions and, and answer them honestly. And then when that's uh, done, you can. Uh, I invite you to just spend a few moments closing out your time in prayer. We've included a few pointers that will help uh, guide and, and direct your prayer time. So please feel free uh, to do that when the teaching is over. With that said, I invite you to get your Bibles and let's get into the study of Job. All right, well, it's good to be back uh, with you in our study of Job. We're going to be in Job 33 uh, for the next few uh, few moments, Job chapter 33. Last time, uh, we were introduced to a man by the name of Elihu, and uh, we learned all about him when we studied Job 32. And Elihu, uh, here, here's what we know about this guy. Number one, uh, he's young. Uh, he's younger than Job, younger than Job's three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. In chapter 32, verse 6, Elihu says, I am young in years. Uh, I am young in years. And, and because he's young and, and Job and the three friends were older, Elihu is very respectful. That's the second thing we learned. Elihu respected his elders. He, he let them talk first. Elihu listened to everything they had to say. He did not interrupt. And in chapter 32, verse 4, it says, Elihu waited to speak to Job because they were older than he. Now, it's, it's not that Elihu didn't have anything to say. He definitely did. In, in chapter 32, verse 18, Elihu says, I am full of words, but the spirit within constrains me. Um, Elihu knew when to talk and when to keep his mouth shut, which teaches us this about Elihu. The third thing, Elihu is wise. He's wise. And in chapter 32, Elihu argues uh, wisdom uh, doesn't only come from age and experience. Uh, wisdom ultimately comes from God. It's the Holy Spirit in a person that makes that person wise. And in chapter 32, verse 8, Elihu says, it is the spirit in man, the breath of the Almighty, that makes him understand. Elihu uh, had the wisdom that comes from God, which means he's going to be truthful uh, in his arguments. You know, uh, the three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, they have argued that Job is suffering because he's sinning. Elihu is going to argue that Job is sinning because he's suffering. And it's Job's suffering that led him to accuse God of being unjust and unkind. And in, in chapter 32, verse 2, we're told that Elihu burned with anger at Job because Job justified himself rather than God. Job declared himself innocent of iniquity while he declared God uh, guilty of injustice. And, and Elihu is going to confront Job on that matter. Um, but here's the thing. Elihu is impartial in his arguments. He's fair. He doesn't take sides. And, and just as he is going to confront Job, um, he's also going to confront Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar for repeatedly accusing Job of sinning without any evidence to back it up. In chapter 32, verse 3, it says that Elihu burned with anger also at Job's three friends because they had found no answer, although they had declared Job to be in the wrong. The three friends accused Job of horrible sins with absolutely no proof of any kind, and Elihu is going to call them out on that. In fact, he, he already did that in chapter 32. In verse 12, he says to the three, I gave you my attention, and behold, there was none among you who refuted Job. In other words, I, I listened to all your accusations, and not one of them could be proven. None of you could prove Job to be in the wrong. So Elihu is angry. He's angry at Job for accusing God of injustice. He's angry at the three friends for accusing Job of iniquity. And, and so he waits and he listens and he hears everything everybody has to say. And, and he thinks through what he's going to say. And, and when the argument came to a stalemate, Elihu steps up to the podium and breaks the silence. And this brings us to chapter 33. In this chapter, Elihu uh, speaks to Job. Elihu 
uh, confronts Job. Let's get into it. Look at verse 1, Job 33, 1. Elihu says, but now hear my speech, O Job, and listen to my words. Okay, a couple things uh, we need to notice there. First of all, uh, notice Elihu actually calls Job by his name. Uh, I mentioned last time that Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, they have made a total of eight speeches, and not one time did they respect Job enough to call him by name. Elihu used Job's name. He says, but now hear my speech, O Job. And then if you look all the way down at verse 31, Elihu says, pay attention, O Job. You see, Elihu was talking to Job, not at Job. Uh, Elihu saw Job as a person to respect, not a problem to resolve. Okay, the other three, they talked at Job, over Job, down to Job. They never talked to Job. To them, Job was a problem that needed correction, not a person who needed compassion. Okay, and guys, you need to be aware of that. If you always see people as a problem you will automatically think that what they need is correction. But when you see them as people, you will show compassion. Yeah, they may need correction from time to time, but that correction will always be mixed with compassion, and that's the goal. That is the goal. Paul said to the, uh, the elders in the church of Ephesus back in, in Acts chapter 20, verse 31, Paul says to them, I admonished you with tears admonishing with tears. You Listen, you will correct someone with compassion when you see him or her as a person, not a problem. Again, Elihu sees Job as a person who needed a lot of compassion and a little correction, and so he spoke to Job, not at Job. Back to verse 1. Elihu says, but now hear my speech, O Job, and listen to all my words. You know, um, back in Job chapter 13, verse 6, um, and then again in, in Job uh, chapter 17, verse 2, Job had asked the three friends to hear him. And now Elihu is asking the same of Job. Job, just as you pleaded with your friends to listen, I plead with you to do the same. Verse 2, behold, I open my mouth, the tongue in my mouth speaks. Elihu is saying, you know, what, 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 what I'm about to say, this has been on the tip of my tongue for a while now. Again, I listen to your words, Job. Will you please listen to mine? Look at verse 3. Elihu says, my words declare the uprightness of my heart. In what my lips know, they speak sincerely. So I want you to notice how confident Elihu is. He says, <clears throat> he says what my lips know. You see, Elihu is not going into this with only half the story. Um, you know, I've, I've lived long enough to know that there's, there's always two sides to a story, and somewhere in the middle is the truth. And so Elihu, because he first took the time to listen to Job, and then he took the time to listen to the three friends, he heard both sides of the story, and, and he's able to go into his argument with confidence. Again, he says in verse 3, My words declare the uprightness of my heart, and what my lips know, they speak sincerely. Elihu is, is saying this, Job, I promise my words will be helpful, not hurtful. Unlike the other three, I promise to speak both truthfully and tenderly. Guys, can I just say, if you're, if you're all truth and zero tenderness, you're going to be hurtful. But if you're all tenderness and zero truth, you're not going to be very helpful. Uh, Elihu promises Job, my words will be helpful, not hurtful, because I will be both tender and truthful. Be tender with the truth. That's the point here. Be tender with the truth. Look at verse 4. Elihu says, the Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. You know, Job previously said in, in chapter 31, verse 15, that God had made him in the womb. Elihu says, Job, I got the same start you did. Uh, just as God fearfully and wonderfully made you, uh, God uh, fearfully and wonderfully made me. We're the same, you and I. Guys, if you're wondering how Elihu was able to see Job as a person who needed compassion and not as a problem who needed correction, it's because Elihu recognized that we're all made by God, okay? We're all made in his image. We're the same. 
Skip down to verse 6. Verse 6, Elihu says, Behold, I am toward God as you are. I too was pinched off from a piece of clay. You know, back in chapter 10, verse 9, Job said, God, you made me like clay, and you will return me to the dust. And Elihu was saying, I'm no different, Job. I too have been formed and molded by God like a piece of clay. We're equal, Job. And because we are, I'm not going to talk down to you as if I'm above you. And even though I'm young, Job, please don't, please don't look down at me as if I'm below you. I'm equal to you. Guys, kindness and compassion. Listen very carefully. Kindness and compassion are not shown to someone based on their race, education, job, wealth. No, kindness and compassion should be shown to everyone because everyone is made by God and made in his image. That is a very good reminder for us today. See, Elihu doesn't see himself as above Job or better than Job, but equal to Job because they were both fearfully and wonderfully made by the God of the universe. And and so that's why Elihu says what he says in verse five. Look at that. Verse five, Elihu says to Job, answer me if you can. Set your words in order before me. Take your stand. In other words, Job, feel free to speak up at any time. I don't want this to be a monologue, but a dialogue. I want this to be a conversation, not a lecture. Your words matter, Job, so please feel free to speak at any time. You know, guys, this is, this is how things get sorted out. This is how conflicts get resolved. This is how people work through issues, by talking and listening. There needs to be a conversation, not a lecture. Elihu is is hoping for some back and forth discussion with Job. However, Job's going to stay silent, but Elihu said, Job, you can interrupt me at any time. Look at verse 7. Verse 7, Elihu is is still reassuring Job here. He, He says to Job, behold, no fear of me need terrify you. Back in, in Job chapter 30, verse 15, Job called Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar terrors. And Elihu says here in chapter 33, verse 7, Job, no fear of me need terrify you. My pressure will not be heavy upon you. Job, I'm not going to be heavy-handed with my words. I promise to be kind. I promise to be truthful, but at the same time, gentle. As somebody once said, uh, absolute truth in the hands of absolute sinners can be absolutely brutal. Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, they were brutal and not truthful. And, And you know, guys, those people are the worst. But I will say this, you're not a whole lot better if you're truthful and brutal. Again, what we're going for here is truthful and tender. Paul said in Ephesians 4.15 that the sign of spiritual maturity is is you are going to speak the truth in love. Um, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, that you could be as eloquent and, and wise with your words as an angel, but if you don't speak in love, you're a noisy gong, you're a clanging cymbal. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 2, that that you could have the gift of prophecy. You could be the most impressive spokesman for God. But if you don't speak in love, if you don't have love, you're nothing. Job's three friends were noisy gongs, clanging cymbals. They were a, a painful, unrelenting ringing in the ears of Job. Elihu promised Job, I will be full of grace and full of truth. Grace and truth. Look at verse 8. Elihu says to Job, surely you have spoken in my ears and I have heard the sound of your words. Job, I hear everything you're saying. I'm I'm picking up what you're putting down. I hear you, Job. You say, verse 9, you say, I am pure without transgression. I am clean and there is no iniquity in me. Guys, Job did say all of that. Job has been defending his innocence this whole time. And in chapter 6, verse 30, Job said that there were no lies or deceit on his tongue. In chapter 10, verse 7, Job said that he was not guilty. In chapter 12, verse 4, Job said that he was an upright and blameless man. In chapter 23, verses 11 and 12, Job said that he had not disobeyed God. And in chapter 27, verse 5, Job said, Till I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. Here in chapter 33, Elihu is like, Job, I've, I've heard what you said, and I'm not here to debate any of that. I'm not here to argue what you've said about yourself, Job. I'm here to argue what you've said about God. 
What did Job say about God? The answer is found in verses 11 and 12. Look at that with me. Verses 11 to 12. Elihu is quoting Job. Behold, he, God, finds occasion against me. He, God, counts me as his enemy. He, God, puts my feet in the stocks and watches all my paths. In other words, Job said, God, you're unjust. You're unfair because you're treating me, an innocent man, as an enemy. In, in Job chapter 16, verses 9 through 11, Job said, God has torn me in his wrath and hated me. He has gnashed his teeth at me. He gives me up to the ungodly and casts me into the hands of the wicked. In chapter 19, verse 7, Job says, I cry out violence, but God does not answer me. I call for help, but there is no justice. Okay, Job was being critical of God. He was accusing God. God, I'm innocent and you're unjust. And Elihu was saying, Job, I am, I am not going to debate what you say about you being innocent, but I will debate what you say about God being unjust. I do take issue with that. Verse 12, look at verse 12. Elihu says to Job, behold, in this, accusing God of injustice, in this you are not right. I will answer you, for God is greater than man. Elihu is saying, Job, no man... No man should ever accuse God of wrongdoing because God is greater than man. God is above man. God is beyond man. And because he is, he has reasons for what he does and what he allows, reasons that are above and beyond man. Guys, since God is greater than us, then don't you think God's got reasons for what he does that are greater than our comprehension, our understanding? Absolutely he does. Isaiah 55, 9 says that God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And not only that, if, if God is greater than man, then who answers to who? Does, does God answer to us or, or do we answer to God? Listen, God is not going to stand before us to give an account. Instead, we will stand before him. We, we will never put God on trial, and, and how dare we even try? Psalm 115.3 says, Our God is in heaven, and he does whatever he pleases. Daniel 4.35 says, God does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, What have you done? Okay, who questions who? God questions us. Who answers to who? We answer to God. All that to say this, know your place. Know your place. Or as we've often heard, stay in your lane. Over Christmas, uh, Carrie got me this, this uh, Lego Statue of Liberty. Yes, I'm, I'm 40 years old. I still play with Legos. In fact, I got this thing proudly uh, displayed in my office. And, and as I was building Lady Liberty, um, she never said to me, right? The, the Lego set never said to me, um, what are you doing? Don't do it that way. Do it this way. Now look at what you've done. You, you messed it all up. That never happened. Never happened. Guys, we, the created, tell God, the creator, what are you doing? This is wrong. You made a mistake. That's how Job was talking to God. And Elihu says, this is all so backwards. God is greater than man. The one who questions is God, and the one who answers is man. Look at verse 13. Elihu says, Job, why do you contend against him, saying he will answer none of man's words? The word contend means to press charges. Job, Job pressed charges against God. Job believed that his suffering was unwarranted, which means God was unlawful, unjust, unfair. And, and the whole time, Job has been like, God, what do you have to say for yourself? Answer me. Why won't you answer me? Elihu is like, Job, God has something to say. Look at verse 14. For God speaks in one way and in two, though man does not perceive it. In other words, Job, God does speak. God speaks in different ways, but because God is greater than man, God speaks to man in ways man doesn't always recognize. Job, you don't realize it, but God has been communicating to you this whole time. Look at verse 15. E Elihu brings up one of the ways God communicates. Verse 15, in a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls on men while they slumber in their beds, then he opens the ears of men. Okay, opening the ears of men is referring to something being revealed to man. 
And in Bible times, especially in the Old Testament, God would, would speak and reveal truth to man through dreams and visions that were usually given to prophets. Um, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 says, Long ago and at many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. Uh, of course, it's different today. Uh, today we have God's completed written word, and, and, and so that is how we receive God's message. God speaks to us through the Bible. Um, 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Um, so today we have God's breathed out word. All of it, Genesis to Revelation, that, that is, it's through that God teaches us and rebukes us and corrects us and trains us. But back in Job's day, uh, obviously they didn't have the whole Bible. It wasn't complete, and, and so God would often give a vision or a dream to a prophet who would then communicate that uh, to the people. And, and notice why God would speak through dreams and visions. Back to verse 16, to open the ears of men and terrify them with warnings. Okay, that the dream or the vision was a warning. Uh, what kind of warning? A warning to do what? Look at verses 17 and 18. That he, God, may turn man aside from his deed and conceal pride from a man. He, God, keeps back man's soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. In other words, God would sometimes send a terrifying dream or vision to scare a person straight. All right? If, if a person receives a terrifying dream or vision from God, it may disturb him enough to, uh, to stay away from sin. Again, this was a warning. Job uh, speaks of his own terrifying dreams. In, in chapter 7, verse 14, Job says to God, you scare me with dreams and terrify me with visions. Eliphaz, one of the three friends, uh, he also had a vision or a dream. In Job chapter 4, Verses 12 through 14, Eliphaz says, Now a word was brought to me stealthily. My ear received the whisper of it amid thoughts from visions of the night. When deep sleep fall on men, dread came upon me in trembling, which made all my bones shake. Again, back in Bible times, God would frequently send dreams and visions to open the ears of men and terrify them with warnings. God would send a vision or, or a dream to get man's attention so that they would listen to his word and, and respond in obedience. Because if they didn't, Elihu says in verse 18 that they may go down into the pit. The word pit is referring to the grave, to death. All right, the dream or the vision was a warning. God was saying, stay away from sin. Do not give yourself over to sin. Remain obedient to me or else you will suffer. Again, God doesn't normally uh, communicate to us through dreams today, not when we have the Bible, not when we have his word. God warns us through his word. So please don't think that every dream you have, God is trying to communicate something to you. You know, God may be saying, well, maybe you shouldn't have eaten that right before bed. And I think more than one bad dream is probably been called caused by a bad diet. You know, I'm going to say that, you know, eating a chalupa at 11 o'clock may lead to a nightmare. All right, so don't, uh, don't think that every dream you have is from God and you have to decipher the hidden message. You know, in fact, there's one particular dream that I've had uh, dozens of times. It's the same dream. And in this dream, I'm going up to preach a sermon and either I can't find my notes or my notes are all out of order and I can't get them back in order and I start to talk and it is a total train wreck. I, I've had that dream over and over again and not one time have I thought, you know, well, what is the deeper meaning behind this? God, what are you trying to teach me here? Listen to me, those who base their lives on dreams instead of scripture, they're going to get confusion instead of direction. No, God can use a dream to rebuke or correct a person trapped in sin. That has happened with some people today, but I don't believe that that is God's normal approach today. Again, it is Scripture that is profitable for rebuking and correcting 2 Timothy 3.16. But in Job's day, God did often speak through dreams and visions. Here's, here's another way God speaks to people, through pain and suffering. Through pain and suffering, Elihu is going to remind Job, uh, you think God's been silent this whole time? God, God is using your suffering, Job, to get your attention. God is speaking to you through suffering. Uh, C.S. Lewis, uh, this is one of, one of his more famous quotes, I, I believe. 
It came from his book, The Problem of Pain. He says this, God whispers to us in our pleasures. God speaks in our conscience, but God shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Um, God uses suffering um, uh, to go to work on us. Right? God uses suffering to humble us, to grow us, to keep our heart close to his, to bring us to a place of submission, to turn us away from sin. Um, Psalm 139, 67. I love this verse. Uh, the psalmist says there, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. All right? Before I was afflicted, before my pain, before my suffering, I was, I was so far away from God. But now, because of my pain, because of my suffering, now I'm closer to God than I've ever been. I'm more obedient to God than I've ever been. I'm more in love with God than I've ever been. And guys, you know, that's exactly what happened in my life. That is my story. You know, I, I, I've uh, admitted to all of you that I've had, I've had health issues for years now. Um, before the health issues, I was a habitual liar. Before the health issues, I had, I had given myself over to pornography. I was, I was a slave to lust, all while calling myself a pastor. I was the biggest hypocrite until God said, enough. God sent affliction my way. God touched my body with sickness, pain, suffering. And believe me when I say, I got the message. God got my attention and he humbled me to my knees and brought me to repentance and submission. It is through my suffering that God in his mercy saved my marriage, my family, my ministry. It's, it's because of my suffering that I have not strayed or wandered. It's because of my suffering that I now love God and his word. I, guys, I've often said that God would rather see you anywhere than in sin. God would rather see you in a hospital bed than in sin because God knows that that sin will destroy you. Sin brings death, Romans 5, 12, Romans 6, 23. So God will do what he has to do to tear you away from your sin. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Notice the affliction Elihu mentions in verses 19 through 22. He says to Job, man is also rebuked with pain on his bed and with continual strife in his bones so that his life loathes bread and his appetite the choicest food. His flesh is so wasted away that it cannot be seen and his bones that were not seen stick out. His soul draws near the pit and his life to those who bring death. Elihu is describing a person who's so sick he can't even get out of bed. The sickness has stolen his appetite so that he doesn't even want to eat, and now he's, he's wasting away. Is Elihu describing Job here? I have no idea, but Job can certainly relate. The person Elihu is describing, the person who's suffering, it's, it's because God wants to get his attention. God wants to open his ears so that he listens to his commands and keeps them. And sometimes that's exactly why God points suffering for a person, because suffering is the only thing that will get his attention and keep his attention. It's through suffering. Now listen, it, it is not, I just want to be clear here, it is not accurate to say that all suffering is caused by God. God is sovereign over all suffering. But by that, I mean God is so in control of everything that he can take the bad stuff, the, the pain and the suffering in life, and he can use it to accomplish so much good in us and through us and for us. Not all suffering is caused by God, but God is in control of all suffering. He's so completely in control that he will use suffering to accomplish his perfect will. Guys, sin causes suffering. Okay, choose to sin, choose to suffer. Now, uh, you know, I'll say this about sin. Uh, it's fun, right? Sin is fun. Sin brings pleasure. Hebrews 11.25 calls it a passing pleasure. It's, it's a short-lived pleasure, but it's still pleasure. However, sin also causes suffering. After the pleasure comes the pain. After the pleasure comes the pain. When, when happy hour's over, the hangover starts. You know, Proverbs 13, 15 says that the, the way of the transgressor is hard. Notice it doesn't say that the way of the transgressor is happy or pleasant or satisfying or joyful. It's hard. The word hard means ruin. 
Rebellion brings ruin. Disobedience brings destruction. Sin brings suffering. So it's wrong to say that all suffering is caused by God. Again, God's in control of all suffering, but he's not the cause of all suffering. Sin causes suffering. Here's another thing, and, and Job's friends really needed to pay attention to this point. Here it is. It is wrong to say that all suffering is God's punishment for sin. It is wrong to say that all suffering is God's punishment for sin. This is what makes Elihu's argument profoundly different from the three friends' argument. Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar have held on to this idea. Job, your sickness, your illness, your suffering, it's because God is punishing you for your sin. That, that is the only reason why anybody suffers. It's God's judgment on them for their sin. Incorrect. Incorrect. Elihu is going to argue that God will sometimes allow suffering into a person's life to keep him from sin. And one of my commentaries said that suffering at times may be preventive, not punitive. Okay, in other words, God sometimes allows suffering to prevent us from sinning, uh, not to punish us for sinning. And the example I brought up before to prove this is uh, the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul talks about that painful, difficult thorn that afflicted him for years. Paul uh, even pleaded with, with God on three separate occasions to take the thorn away. You see, Paul, um, Paul didn't want to be sick or, or whatever his thorn was. It may not have been purely physical. Whatever it was, Paul didn't want it, and so he prayed for healing. Guys, nobody wants to be sick. Everybody prays for healing. But when you can see how your sickness, how your suffering is actually keeping you close to God and away from sin, you learn to be thankful. P.T. Forsyth, he was a Scottish theologian who lived in the 1800s. He once said this, it is a greater thing to pray for pain's conversion than for its removal. All right, think of it. If, if God were to remove your pain and suffering and you were to go right back to your sin and rebellion, well, that would be the worst thing for you because Elihu is reminding us that your sin and rebellion, that is going to take you straight down to the pit, to the grave, death. I've, I've said before, I'll, I'll say it again, I never, ever want to go back and be the person I was before I was afflicted. Again, the way of the transgressor is hard. The worst place to be is away from God. And now that God and I are close again, I never want to stray. I never want to wander. Like the hymn says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. That's me. And God has used suffering in my life to keep me close to him and, and away from sin. Now, do I still sin? Absolutely. But, I, but I'm nothing like what I was. I'm nothing like what I, what, I, what I used to be. God has used suffering in my sanctification. And he did the same thing with Paul's suffering, with Paul's thorn. Do, do you remember what Paul said um, about why he was given his thorn? 2 Corinthians 12, 7, Paul says, um, to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in the flesh. Um, Paul saw his suffering, not as a weapon to tear him down, but as God's tool to build him up. Had God removed the thorn, like Paul asks, Paul might have become proud. You know, had God removed the thorn, Paul might have fallen deep into sin. And Paul, that's the last thing he wanted. And so he learned to thank God for his thorn because of how God was using his thorn. And Elihu was hoping that Job would learn to see his suffering as God's way of keeping him in line, and, and he would then thank God for it. Elihu is reminding Job, hey, you know, God has not been silent. He's been speaking this whole time through dreams, through suffering. You just, you just haven't been listening. All right, now guys, look at verse 23. Let me just say this before I go any further. The rest of this chapter is very interesting. Um, I, I had a hard time working through this and trying to figure things out. But, you know, when, when I saw Jesus Christ in these verses, they became remarkable. The rest of this chapter became remarkable to me. I, I, I truly love studying this. Verse 23, Elihu says to Job, um, if there be for him an angel, all right, now, guys, you may recall that the book of Job begins with the angels presenting themselves before the Lord. In other words, the angels were reporting for duty. We saw this in Job chapters 1 and 2. Um, in Job chapters 4 and 5, Eliphaz talks about the angels. 
And here in Job 33, Elihu talks about an angel. Okay, not angels plural, angels singular. Elihu is painting a picture for us, okay? Now, remember, he's already talked about a sinner being warned by God through dreams and visions. Elihu has talked about how God has tried to get the sinner's attention through sickness and suffering. The sinner has got one foot in the grave and, and one foot out. He's near death. Again, look at verse 22. His soul draws near the pit and his life to those who bring death, all right? So there doesn't seem to be much hope for this sinner. But then a special messenger, an angel, shows up. Again, look at verse 23. If there be for him an angel, right? And he's not just any angel. Notice verse 23 says that he is a, he's a mediator, mediator, one among a thousand to declare to man what is right for him. Guys, we see that this, this angel, okay, and I got it in quotes, a quotation mark. This angel, he's, he's got a very a specific ministry. It's, it's these two things. Uh, number one, he tells the sinner what, what, what he ought to do. Again, the end of verse 23 says to declare to man what is, what is right for him. And here's the second thing. This, this angel intercedes on the sinner's behalf to reconcile and restore the sinner to God. Verse 23 uses the word mediator. Okay, so who is this angel who tells sinners what's true and who reconciles sinners to God? Who is this angel? It's Jesus Christ. Okay, did you know that in the Old Testament there were times when, when somebody saw a being so marvelous, so glorious, that they could only describe him as the angel of the Lord? Did you know that what they were actually seeing was no angel but the pre-incarnate Son of God? Okay, let me, let, me, let me prove this to you from Scripture. I'll, I'll just give you one example um, way back in Genesis chapter 16. So this is where um, Sarah convinces Abraham to sleep with her, uh, her servant girl, Hagar. Okay, you, you, you probably know the backstory. Um, God had promised Abraham descendants. God said that Abraham would be the father of a nation. This nation would bless all nations. And his wife, Sarah, at the time was unable to conceive. So she decided to, to help God out by sending in Hagar to get pregnant um, by Abraham. And so Hagar goes into Abraham's tent, a maid, and she comes out a mom, and Sarah becomes jealous and hates Hagar. She starts abusing Hagar to the point where Hagar has to, has to run away. And, and listen to this, Genesis 16, 11 through 13. It says, And the angel of the Lord said to Hagar, Behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. So Hagar called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, you are a God of seeing. For she said, truly here, I have seen him who looks after me. Okay, so notice Genesis 16, 11 tells us that the angel of the Lord spoke to Hagar. And yet Genesis 16, 13 tells, that, tells us that Hagar called this angel of the Lord, the God of seeing. So that, that angel of the Lord was none other than the second person of the Trinity, God's son, Jesus. Right? Okay, I'll just here's a few more examples. The, the, um, the angel of the Lord who stood in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That was Jesus. The angel of the Lord who wrestled with Jacob by the river of Jabbok. That was Jesus. The angel of the Lord who stopped Abraham from sacrificing Isaac. That was Jesus. The angel of the Lord who appeared to Joshua right before the battle of Jericho. That was Jesus. And the, the angel of the Lord whom Elihu says is a mediator between God and man. Who is that? Who is that? Well, it's Jesus. Look at verse 24. Elihu says, and, and he, the, the angel, is merciful to him, the sinner, and says, deliver him from going down into the pit. I have found a ransom. Okay, so, so not only is this angel our mediator, but he's also our ransom. The word ransom means the price paid to redeem or rescue a person. The price paid to rescue a person. I can, I can even simplify that for you. A ransom is purchasing freedom. Guys, the sinner, which is all of us, the sinner cannot be set free by money. Um, 1 Peter 5, 8 says you were, uh, 1 Peter 1, 18 says you were ransomed not with perishable things such as silver or gold. 
The sinner cannot be set free by money or by good works. Titus 3, 5 says that we were ransomed not by any righteous deeds done by us. The ransom for a sinner's freedom, uh, well, it's a ransom that God must accept and God requires the shedding of blood. 1 Peter 1, 18, again, it says, you were ransomed not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but, 1 Peter 1, 19, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Guys, a, a perfect substitute, a sinless sacrifice was required to ransom sinners. Only a perfect God could provide that ransom and, and God did. God, God gave us his perfect son, Jesus. And Elihu is saying God has provided a ransom for sinners who are on their way to the pit. And the sinner who receives the ransom God has provided. Elihu says in verse 25, look at that. Verse 25, let his flesh become fresh with youth. Let him return to the day of his youthful vigor. In other words, the sinner ransomed by God, he becomes brand new a brand new creation with a brand new heart and brand new desires. And that brand new person, he, he prays to God, verse 26, then he prays to God and God accepts him. He sees his face with a shout of joy. The ransomed sinner now has a relationship with God, fellowship with God, friendship with God. Not only that, but, but, but he, the ransomed sinner, will sing and shout of God's mercy to others. He will sing of how God did not give him what his sins deserve. Because that's, that's what mercy is. It's, it's, it's punishment withheld. Look at verse 27. He, the ransomed sinner, sings before men and says, I sinned and perverted what was right, and it was not repaid to me. Verse 28, he, this, this angel of the Lord, God's son, he has redeemed my soul from going down into the pit, and my life shall look upon the light. Guys, God desires to save sinners from the pit, from death. But the sinner in his stubborn rebellion loves his sin, and verse 22 says that he draws near the pit. Uh, Proverbs 14, 12 says that there is a way that seems right to a man, but that, but that way leads to death. That's the sinner. Because he loves his sin more than God, he is on the broad way, road, the broad way that leads to death, and he doesn't even know it. And, and so what does God do? Well, he sends his only son to be our mediator and our ransom. And God's Son, Jesus Christ, as our mediator, he stood in between us and a holy God, and he took God's wrath for our sin. And, and as our ransom, Jesus paid the price that God required for our freedom by sacrificing himself and shedding his blood. And, and, and guys, not only did God do all the work to rescue a sinner, but he's also doing everything he can to warn the sinner. Dreams and sickness and suffering. The sinner has been warned once, twice, three times, again and again and again. Look at verse 29. Behold, God does all these things twice, three times with a man to bring his soul from the pit that he may be lighted with the light of life. Um, the person who dies in his sin and goes down to the pit, whose fault is that? It's not God's. It is not God's. God gave the sinner a warning and God gave the sinner a way out, a way out through Jesus Christ, our mediator and ransom. The sinner needs to listen, right? The sinner needs to heed the warning, just like Elihu pleaded with Job. Look at verse 31. Pay attention, O Job. Listen to me. Be silent, and I will speak. Again, Elihu wanted this to be a monologue, not a dialogue, a conversation, not a lecture. So he says in verse 32, Job, if you have any words, answer me. Speak, for I desire to justify you. If not, listen to me, be silent, and I will teach you wisdom. And guys, Elihu is going to share more of his wisdom in the next chapter, which Lord willing, uh, we'll get to next week. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for uh, feeding us with your word. We thank you for um, God, what, what, what you've done in our lives. Thank you for how um, you started a good work in us with salvation, and you will, you will finish that work. You promise to bring it to completion. You promise to fully sanctify us until we are perfectly glorified in heaven. And God, you, um, you do that through so many different ways. You, you sanctify us, you grow us, you change us through your word, uh, through the, uh, the rebuke and the counsel of other believers. 
Um, God, you can, you can change us and grow us. I know for me the most you have done that through suffering, through pain, through difficulty, through sickness. God, thank you for bringing good out of that. Um, thank you for doing what you had to do to get my attention and, and turn me away from my sin and bring me back to you. And uh, God, uh, I know that um, uh, you discipline all those you call sons and daughters. So um, God, I thank you for your discipline. I thank you that when uh, we are disobedient, when we rebel, you go after us. Um, you bring us back into the fold, and God, you have, you have done that in my life. You will continue to do that. Thank you for holding on to me. Thank you for never letting me go. Um, I've often tried to let you go, but you will never let go of me. And um, you do that for all your kids, for all your children. Nothing can snatch us out of your hand. And God, ultimately, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for being our mediator. Thank you for standing in the gap for standing in between us and a holy God and uh, you taking God's wrath in our place for our sin. And God, thank you for ransoming us uh, through Jesus Christ. Uh, thank you for buying us um, with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or spot. And so we just, we praise him tonight. God, thank you for what you've done in all of our lives. And we thank you most of all for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.